In Fallout, there's tons of ways to take out enemies, like using guns, chems, or even explosives. But what if you didn't want to do any of that? What if you wanted the enemies to take themselves out? Could you beat the entirety of Fallout 4 with only reflective damage? Reflective damage comes in three different forms. You have the ricochet perk, which sends bullets back at enemies, punishing gear that sends back a percentage of damage dealt to you through melee attacks, and damage through blocking with melee weapons through legendary affixes like blazing or charged. But since all of these can be acquired through RNG, I will be using a leveling exploit to speed up the process as I've proved you can hit whatever level you want to without leaving Sanctuary. So with that out of the way, let's see if this is even possible. Like with any run, I decided to play the most beautiful woman to ever grace Fallout 4, besides the Overseer in Vault 81 of course, and then set my stats. For starting stats, I went with a 10 in Endurance to be able to take some hits and a 10 in Luck for Ricochet. Now, notice how I said starting stats? That's because this run without a doubt requires a lot more perks than I'm allowed to pick and trust me, we're going to need every single one of them. I ran through the end of the world and tried to become the best frozen dinner that no one would ever eat, blitzed past some rad roaches gently as to not too badly damage their ankles, grabbed the pit boy and upon making it outside, now the real game could begin. Now heading into this challenge, the first major obstacle was being able to acquire gear, and without a way to kill anything, my plan was to get enough ranks into pickpocket and sneak to be able to take anything they had in their inventory. Plus, with the whole legendary luck nonsense, I also thought that getting enough gear to be able to reflect damage would take ages. So to help speed this process up, I headed over to Saugus Ironworks and politely grabbed the picket fence magazine to race back home to Sanctuary, scrapped some lampposts, and then did a couple hidden features to amass enough copper to fill my settlements with statues to help me pretend that people still lived in Sanctuary. Now at level 30, here's how the build was shaping up. We had a 9 in strength for 2 ranks of rooted giving us a boost to damage resistance, max ranks of pickpocket, 3 ranks in toughness, 3 ranks in life giver, charisma up to 3 for 2 ranks in lone wanderer, and aqua girl to be able to take a swim in e-girl bathwater. Although even with all these perks and playing on very hard difficulty, I forgot to take sneak levels, and in a common lapse of judgement that happens over here on Crisis Gaming, I tried to go find legendary enemies to loot only to get turned away every single time. However, a mad dog helped me out by informing me Cleo of Good Neighbor sold a piece of reflecting armor. Only issue is, it was worth a whopping 24,000 caps. Good thing I had all that spare copper lying around. With our first piece of reflecting gear, we can now inflict a grand total of 10% of any damage done to us through a melee attack back to the assailant and god if that isn't specific enough. Although, 10% damage might as well be fucking useless, because the damage appeared almost non-existent, even against ghouls which would be considered some of the lower tier enemies. And due to the level ups we had, these bastards were hitting hard. We were gonna die before we killed them, so I was gonna need more pieces of reflect gear if I was ever going to be able to do anything. But because I didn't have any sneak levels, I went back and leveled up a few more times to grab those before heading out any further. Welcome to level 37! But still unsatisfied with my gear, I decided to head to Far Harbor in the hope that the first mission would have some legendary enemies to loot. On the way I ran into a pack of wild dogs with a legendary among them. Not wanting to risk losing it, I lured it into as many enemies as I could to take it down, and was rewarded with my second piece of reflecting gear. Now I had a whole 20% of damage reflect. This'll be easy, surely. Making it to the Nakano residence, I agreed to borrow their boat, head to Far Harbor, and find their missing child. Oh, what's this? Oh, I had my fingers crossed. Oh well, since I have the keys, I might as well still use them, right? Arriving in the beautiful township of Cthulhu Cultus, waiting on the return of their master, I talked the town into killing a ton of eldritch horrors that had a potential for being legendary drops. But even after resetting them a few times, these silly little gulpers didn't want to drop anything of use. So I decided to move on. I made my way back to the Commonwealth and tried luring mobs into anything that could help me out, but sadly RNG was not on my side, and without a reliable way to deal damage, this run was starting to look like a grind fest. Except, that same mad dog that pointed out the first piece of reflect gear told me about a loot lock location. 
Now, loot locking, for those of you who don't know, is going into an area that a legendary enemy can spawn and that you haven't been into yet and dropping a save outside. As soon as you enter the area, you drop a quick save. What this allows you to do is check the room for a legendary and kill it. If it drops a weapon or armor piece that you want but the legendary affix is bad, then you reload the quick save. And now when you kill the enemy, the item will stay the same but the affix will change. And if neither the affix or the item is what you're after, then you reload the hard save that you made outside, walk inside, drop a quick save, and do the whole process over again. Now, you may be asking yourself, what could he possibly be hunting for? And the answer is a piece of wood. But not just any wood. I'm looking for a blazing piece of wood. Blazing is a legendary affix that has a 25% chance of inflicting 50 points of fire damage to your enemy. And with this weapon, I could go forward able to be a bit more aggressive in dealing damage, while still being able to do damage to enemies attacking me from behind. However, this doesn't work for enemies holding guns. And I would soon learn this the hard way. But before that, you know I had to do it to him. With that out of the way, now it was time for the Triggerman, and I'll be honest, this was goofy. Enemies in Fallout 4, for whatever reason, seem to have their AI break when it comes to being directly in their face. But blocking did in fact deal with most threats, so thankfully this run wasn't dead just yet. However, as dead as the run may not have been, moving forward dealing with massive groups of enemies was going to be the hardest part of this playthrough. Especially since if I became overread, I was going to be the one on the floor suit after. I snuck up on Dino and stole his gun and the passcode for Nick's terminal, then demonstrated to Nick the strategy for the upcoming area. I tried my hardest to guard Nick by standing in front of enemies and trying to draw aggro, but it became apparent very quickly that I would be on my own for most of this. Nick went down at every opportunity he could, leaving me to have to take on everyone in the area while drinking water in between blocks. Now keep in mind, these were just two melee guys, and although I could block them, the others shooting at me had free damage as there was nothing I could do about it. It eventually got to the point where I was running back and forth between transition doors to bring Nick from the dead. But even with this, Nick continued to show that he would rather catch bullets with his face than shoot them from his gun. Just a quick question, right? How long did it take you to rescue Nick? Don't, like, don't, be honest, you can tell me, right? 10 minutes, 15, maybe even 30 on a first playthrough? Well, how's this for example? This one section took over an hour and a half. And because I didn't even consider leveling into Charisma, Skinny Malone went down just like the rest of the vaults. I got a couple lucky ricochet kills, but it was heaps of running into enemies and trying to get them in the melee range and in the hopes that my blazing board would proc and hurt them. And I'm telling you now, this build is insane. Not because it's good, but because you have to be insane to try it. Feeling unstoppable at being able to free Nick, I decided to immediately jump into taking on Fort Hagen, but little did I know that this area would require the most work out of the entire run. The top floor of Fort Hagen is nothing, you just sprint to the elevator then race to the lower level, it's super easy. And same goes for the bottom floor, as you just run to where Kellogg is. But now what I needed to do was steal the guns away from the synths in the room. You can't pickpocket Kellogg in here as he goes straight into talking to you. So instead, I triggered the fight and lured the synths away to hopefully block them to death, but Kellogg's 44 does insane damage on very hard, and I didn't have near enough healing supplies to tank that and still deal with the synths. Not only that, but Kellogg's grenades also did no damage to the synths, so it's not like I could even like lure them through the grenades. At this point, I didn't have any way of dealing with the pistol, mainly because Kellogg doesn't ever seem to gun bash. But this wasn't in vain, I did manage to push a synth into the Shadow Realm at least. But seeing as I was getting my ass kicked by a synth and a bald washed up cereal brand, I was either going to need a ton of healing supplies or a better plan. And I figured if Kellogg and his goons couldn't see me, then maybe I'd stand a chance, which means I went off to join the railroad. While doing this, I just had to keep telling myself it was all for the longer duration stealth boys, because having to watch Deacon struggle to fight these synths was just on a whole nother level. Like, between Nick and Deacon, I don't know who has the worst AI. The only way I could even help was by running in front of the synths and trying to draw their aggro, but from what it looks like, once an enemy focuses on its target, it doesn't look like you can influence it at all unless you actually attack back, which we can't do. Trying to block her standing in front of the enemy doesn't actually seem like it does anything at all. But don't worry, Deacon made sure to pay me back for helping him out. Oh yeah, we don't trigger these. 
I can step on it all I want. I hate this guy. Returning back to the railroad and buying some self boys, I tried Fort Hagen again, but Kellogg decided he was going to stand directly under a laser turret. This may not sound like that big a deal, but apparently turrets can see you even with four ranks of sneak and two covert magazines and a stealth boy active. If this was on purpose, I'd say that Kellogg was the smartest person ever, but as we'll find out later, this was just pure luck. On another attempt, I did manage to get Kellogg to stand idle in the room before his boss fight, but then disaster struck. Todd Howard in his infinite wisdom made Kellogg unable to be pickpocketed. Why? Couldn't tell ya. I could slam a fan into his face and push him across the floor, but when it came to rummaging through his pockets, that was a no-go. Who thought this made sense? So not only did Kellogg not do gun bashes, but he also couldn't have his ammo stolen. I'm not gonna lie, the run was looking pretty dead at this point, but like a homie popping out of a trash can, Mad Dog once again suggested finding Lucas Miller, who had an armor piece with a 10% chance to disarm melee enemies. Now, this may not sound like it'll help the run at all, but apparently Bethesda goofed the code and it was actually a 10% chance to disarm anything that did damage to me, melee or not. So I went and I tracked down Lucas and tried Fort Hagen again, making sure to loot the ammo away from the synths and starting the fight. And the disarm worked! I'm not sure that Kellogg is supposed to be disarmed as his gun went through his hand, but I still couldn't take the damage coming at me from all sides. Blocking melee attacks does cancel out damage you receive, but blocking is very precise in this game, and if you get attacked from the side while blocking, the block doesn't work. And upon loading a save, Kellogg had his gun back, so I was back to square one. This was getting absurd, but with the ability to disarm Kellogg, this was possible. I just had to figure out how to survive long enough to win. The only thing I could think to help me at this point would have been Ballistic Weave, so I ventured out to do the Boston After Dark quest which involves escorting a synth to a railroad safe house. But what happened instead was I had to fend off raiders for a day and a half of blocking, and then watch as the railroad agent and synth run away, aggroed everything in the map causing the entire area around Bunker Hill to turn into a fucking war zone. The only way we were able to proceed was by having me solo a construction site full of super mutants and blocking them to death. So what if it took an hour? The mission was finally completed, and now I had to go do some safe house missions for Pam. The first one was easy enough in taking the Starlight Drive in and fending off the mole rats, and the second grabbing some details about the Augusta safe house, which would just meant running for my life and only grabbing what needed to be grabbed. But with these missions done, this allowed me to buy ballistic armor from Tinker Tom and upgrade clothes that it could be applied to. But I'd have to go grind out more levels as the only other thing I could think of would be getting ranks in medics to make stim packs go further and max ranks in armor to upgrade ballistic weave to its maximum potential. I ran around getting the materials to craft both a set of clothes and hat to max ballistic weave. If this didn't work, I had no ideas left. So in I went again, with a 10% chance to disarm Kellogg, 20% of reflect damage through my armor, and a spicy stick. And almost immediately, I got cornered in a room full of bunk beds. And even with all of this protection, I was still taking absurd damage. But like some kind of Todd Howard miracle, Kellogg not only got disarmed, but also dropped his revolver. In the shuffle of bodies, I managed to grab the revolver, then ran away to reset tempo in my favor. This ended up working beautifully. Sure, I had the whole of Fort Hagen attacking me, but Kellogg was at least taking damage now, so now I just had to struggle through. But here's where things get weird. The AI went from one massive dog pile to one synth attacking me while the rest of the group just looked on in anticipation to take its place. And then the synth left with no one replacing it. It just turned into a staring match until I walked forward and finally the synths got the idea to fight me back. This took quite a while of maneuvering around, but through some kind of witchcraft, I did manage to slowly get synths to leave the room. I'm guessing they were trying to go find guns to shoot me with, but they didn't have any ammo, so I don't know what good that was gonna do. But Kellogg didn't have that mentality and decided to finally cooperate and fight me. What was even funnier about this was the fact that while Kellogg attacked me, his synths just watched from the other side of a table. This took over an hour and a half for just Kellogg through two stim packs. But we came out victorious with Kellogg finally dying to the power of reflect damage. 
I could finally progress. After looting Kellogg's unlootable pockets and running to Good Neighbor, I traversed through the brains of a dude who died to blocking and then raced to go help the Miniman out. My thought process at this point was to speed through the entry quest by getting the Roaming Brotherhood to steal outside to deal with Concord, and then race through Fort Vega to have Jerry meet the same fate as many of his followers. But I decided to stay with the Minutemen mainly due to the fact that I didn't think I could take out the shield generators during the last Institute mission, so Preston and his homies were gonna have to soldier up. I continued taking settlements and showing off my spicy stick, eventually having Preston ask me to take back the castle. And I won't lie, this moment had me worried. The Minutemen usually struggle to deal with the Mirelurks here, let alone the Queen. Except on very hard difficulty, the radio operator went nuts. Armed with only an automatic pipe pistol, this man seemingly soloed the entire castle, even the Queen. But don't worry, I did draw aggro away from the Mirelurks to give the homie a chance. But to my surprise, yeah, this went fairly well. Maybe I do have a chance at doing this. With the castle secured, I went and recruited Ada by just watching her kill tons of robots, and then went and showed the behemoth at Carhenge what I did to Swan, grabbed a locket for Abenathy Farm, and showed Sarge in the castle basement what I did to the behemoth at Carhenge and Swan. Without a moment to lose, I was now able to focus on the end game. I wanted a party, so I went to the only person who I knew would be down to hang out. Uh, I didn't think that was going to be literal. Well, at least she gave me the Courser shutdown code. So I ran over to Virgil, grabbed the location of said Courser, and then ran past all of the Courser's bodyguards to watch the Courser do the ultimate reflect move and turn its own brain off. This allowed me to go and get the Courser chip decoded and move into the final stretch of the game. Now came the time to bring it all home. I constructed a teleporter with the Minutemen and got inside the Institute, only to tell Father that I would win this battle of attrition by doing nothing. Bold words to live by, but even bolder to make them true. And I wouldn't have to wait too long before I got to put these words to the test. Again, I won't lie, heading into the castle defense quest did seem daunting, and I thought for sure this would take forever. But surprisingly, it didn't. If you consider 45 minutes not that long. Between all the companions I'd sent there as well as the unkillable radio operator, I essentially just had to be a distraction to the synths. I did the usual run in their face and have them attack me tactic, but mainly I was just here for pickup duty, as in getting them to lose their gun with my 10% chance to disarm and then take the gun off the floor so only my homies had weapons. And even though it took a while, this strategy was by far the safest and most effective, turning Fallout 4 into the next Like a Dragon title. Now with only the Institute itself left standing between me and victory, it was time to live up to Father's promise. Look, the Minutemen may not be the strongest faction, but they have lots of heart. And I'm not talking about the ones on the floor. With the distraction caused by Preston and the gang, I raced to the reactor to plant the explosive and get teleported away, allowing me to set off the bombs and watch as I failed the run. Because look, I don't care how you look at it, I totally just killed all the people in that building. With Kellogg giving as many issues as he did, I didn't actually think the run was doable, but here we are at the end of things, just by using reflective damage. Moving forward, I do have a couple of things in the works, but videos might take a bit more time to put out, so make sure to subscribe and stick around for more. I want to give a massive shout out to the members over on Patreon and to the channel members for keeping the lights on over here, and for all of you who stop by the live streams to join in on the silliness. As always, I've been Chris from Crisis Gaming, and I will see you guys on the next one.